uh, trauma and burn education via Zoom. We are going to try this out and see how it works. A um, couple statements we have to make. The Association for Nursing Professional Development is accredited as a provider of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. That's a mouthful. Um, this um, education is going to be worth one hour. It will expire um, two years from today. So if you are looking at this in March 18th of 2023, you will not get hours for this. This is worth one trauma hour and 0.5 burn hours. In order to get your hours, you need to view the entire Zoom session and complete the online evaluation and attestation of completion. When this is uploaded into YouTube, it'll be in the comments section. So once you've finished watching the Zoom session, you will click on the link and it will be just like taking an evaluation um, for any type of trauma and burn education you've ever done, which means your computer needs to be attached to a printer so you can print out your CEUs. Um, there are no conflict of interest exists for anyone in the position to control content for this activity. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce um, Dr. McKinley. He is an, a, one of our attending um, physicians in the emergency department, and he is going to talk to us about one of his really cool projects, and um, thanks a lot. I'm so excited, and I appreciate being involved in the beginning of what will be a very protracted course of video conferencing, so it's fun to be at the forefront of that. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Let's see, what do we have here? I'm no pro at, uh, at teleconferencing, but please participate. Um, I think it's less important to mute your microphone given uh, you all seem like pros. So if everybody wants to leave their microphone on, that's fine. And I'll only make a fuss if there's a lot of background noise. Um, my objectives today are, uh, for, and it's really objectives for, for you all, is to make sure you're understanding important concepts about simulation modeling, that we can explore one example of a problem that could be solved with a discrete simulation model. And we're describing four basic steps to develop uh, a discrete sim simulation model. And at the end, I wanna make sure we can apply knowledge of a discrete event simulation to create a primary outcome for a study that I'm using simulation modeling for. Is everybody able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I don't need anyone to give names because I uh, know who all of you are, but I am gonna call on Cindy first. What is a model? Uh, a model would be like a smaller representation of something that's bigger. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's a, it's a simplified representation of a complex system or object. And it can be physical, mathematical, which is what I like descriptive. Importantly, a model does not have to be built to represent an object that's, that currently exists. It can be an object or system that's imaginary, extinct, futuristic, contemporaneous. Um, some folks might be real, um, but we will move on. Um, so simulation models have nothing to do with simulation education or mannequins. And for our purposes today, simulation is the imitation of a system's operation over time. Discrete event simulation models, which is what I'm specifically interested in, what we're talking about today. These are complex computational models used for decades by systems engineers to gain insight into complex systems. Um, Jen Fritzin, what, uh, or have you ever used a discrete event simulation model before? Oh, probably. Yeah. Have any of you guys played <laughs> SimCity 2000? Oh yeah, or like when you the other ones like where you build a adventure land or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so the the adventure lands um, <laughs> the uh, continuous simulation, which works a little bit differently. The SimCity, even maybe SimCity three thousand, is a discrete event simulation model. It runs in time steps of days or months, and this is fundamental to DES. The system state changes at distinct time steps or events, and some of those SimCity experiences they look like they're continuously changing but um they're rapid rapidly iterating different steps uh, uh, different states in time and so time is constantly marching forward and it may look fluid but they're actually discrete steps um now i'm so sorry other jen what is your name it's actually jen smell and 
And you're from the PICU. Have we worked together? I, I don't know. I could, probably not. Um, I will, I'll try and make my way up to the PICU sometime in the next year, um, but maybe not for any, maybe I'll actually stay out of any part of the hospital where I don't belong until COVID is <laughs> but we'll get to know each other at some point. Um, do you want to take a shot at what is a system? Well, looking at the, what looks to me like a, a flow chart, uh -huh. I assume um, that that's representation of a system. So what I'm going to guess is that it, it should show an example of, of a process from start to finish and what happens during each step. I think that, that hits all the important points. A system <laughs> is any, any uh, space in which components work together. It has boundaries, um, so you define a system by those boundaries in part. And it has a beginning and an end. Um, another way to put that is in, in, it has inputs and outputs. Um, but it, we think of systems as somehow constrained. So we don't. Um, so we're not trying to understand a system as the whole world. We we, we have to draw boundaries around it to make it somehow just uh, a, a specific concept. And a system can be as simple as an ATM or as complex as a global distribution network. Um, discrete event simulation models can help us understand the impact of previously implemented system changes and plan future changes to that system. So they can also help us predict the impact of system stressors like a disaster. Um, and we are currently on disaster footing. So I think the five of us should now use discrete event simulation modeling to explore our current crisis. Um, I think it was Churchill who said this, that never let a good crisis go to waste, which we won't today. Um, and I have participants, so we are ideally positioned uh, for me. Give me one second. I, I, I want you all to imagine that we had unlimited access to PCR testing for COVID-19. Pretty sure that's not the case, um, but work with me. And um, Liz, can you, yes. can you tell me, how might you go about testing patients? So in this universe where we have um, wonderful federal planning and uh, operation systems that work and just everything is working, we are ahead of the game and we now suddenly have COVID-19 PCR testing for anyone who wants it, it's unlimited. How would you go about testing patients if you don't want to bring them to the ER? I don't want to bring them to the ER. Well, I would first... Oh, so out, outside of the hospital, correct? Yeah, let's just say they're, they're all coming to our hospital to get tested. We've got tons and tons of test kits. Um, and we're really put together. We've been able to get the test kits, but we, don't, we haven't, don't have a way to have people tested elsewhere. Have people tested. Well, we'd have to um, initially advertise that we have this testing um, okay. and we would out. want to advertise that it needs to stay out of the, out of the ER. So we need to advertise where we are testing folks and who would be appropriate to be tested. So we would need some mass communication that for a certain subset of folks, we can offer this testing. And I would recommend it at a remote location outside of the main hospital. Um, I, I think that's good. So we're, we're gonna prevent them from coming into the hospital. And um, they're, so I know that in Seattle and maybe South Korea, they're actually doing drive-by testing. Let's say we haven't just put together enough to do that. So a car arrives, testing. And what you're saying is we want to constrain the, the number of people coming. So we want to somehow say, don't everyone in DC come mm -hmm. just for kicks. Mm -hmm. um, and from a modeling perspective, what we're doing there is we're trying to um, limit the frequency of arrivals because our system for testing can still only handle so many, even though we have infinite tests. Right. Let's say that uh, car, it, it, in an ideal world where some people are listening and for the most part, they're not all descending us, on us at once, how, how frequently do you think somebody might drive by for testing? Well, I wonder if we should, oh, sorry, Can we, should we even back up and say, you know, 
um, it has to be at the recommendation of a healthcare provider. So ideally, kid has cold symptoms at home plus high fever. Family member calls the pediatrician who says, "Hey, I need. I think for the safety of all, you should go get tested." It's yeah, that, that's a way better. So rather than rather than having, so I don't know how many kids are in DC. Or if we just ballpark, there are a million people in DC and. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just kids that we can test at our hospital, and there are 200,000 kids at the hospital uh, that, that might come to the hospital, and all the appropriate kids should be tested within the first two days. You can, you can do some um, basic arithmetic to figure out what is our estimate of how frequently kids can come, and you can dial up and dial down how severe you want symptoms to be to make it appropriate for testing as a way to limit the frequency of arrivals. Um, all this to say, let's just ballpark it. We've, we've made recommendations. We expect a car to arrive every 10 minutes with somebody that wants to be tested. Does that seem within the realm of possibilities? Sure. All right. And so we've got this car. It's coming in every, oh, is that at my entity? Yeah, sorry. It's, it's a little bit clunky. Work with me here. So we, we have somebody's arriving by car every 10 minutes. Let's just keep them on Michigan Avenue. Imagine this white space is Michigan Avenue in front of the hospital. Who's going to do our testing? Um, uh, Cindy, who do you want? Who, who's going to actually do the nose swab? Uh, nurses. Yep. Nurses are going to wind up doing that nose swab. All right, so let's put one nurse out there. They've got like an airline, like the, the, those red flashlights. They're waving people in and swabbing that nose. Uh, Can we complicate things? So I want it to be members of the decon team that are nurses. Okay, I think that's fair. So it's a more limited resource. So yes. uh, decon nurse, is that, uh, wait, what do you, there, there are specific nurses that you think might be appropriately trained for this? So there are nurses that are on the decon team. I'm one of them uh -huh. um, that have been like trained with all of the hazmat stuff. Cause I'm thinking about like things other than COVID, but um, I guess like nurses trained at like a little bit of a higher level on that type of practice. Yeah. So a decon nurse is a fine for a name. Keep that in the back of your mind and the, more or less the number of those nurses that might be available. It, uh, you think for our hospital, is that more than 10, more than 50? Uh, probably 15. Okay. Um, so that is a very limited resource. We'll get back to that. Um, and let's see, one of the Jens, Jen, uh, I'm struggling with Jen Welsh. Is, is it Welsh is the last name or Welsh? No, it's, it's smell as in the sense. I don't know why it doesn't show my last name. I didn't type it in or anything, it just appeared. I, I, I've written it down and I now have no excuse. So work with me, Jen Smell. <laughs> um, what do you okay. think the shortest time? Do you ever have to swab notes from the PICU? Yeah. Well, not anymore, but the swab itself is relatively quick, depending on how cooperative the pediatric patient is, uh -huh. but it's the processing, so you ha you'd have to package it. Am I going too far? Like, the swab itself is is relatively quick. Yeah, you're ahead of us. I want, so in addition to actually swabbing the nose, you have to print the label, you have to track right. down the tube, you have to send it to the lab, you have to follow up with lab to make sure they received it. There are all these sort of embedded steps. But for simplicity's yep. sake, let's imagine that your only job is to swab that nose. Um, and you, uh, there's the, the amount of time, it, it, since it's a decon nurse, the amount of time they need to gown up and down for PPE is negligible. They can do it in a fraction of a second because they're human. And we're assuming it's just the actual swab of the nose. What, what's the fastest time in, when, when you were a picky floor nurse that you could swab a nose? 30 seconds, two minutes? Uh, as long as I have someone holding the patient's arms away from their nose. It's holding their head. We'll, we'll put it at a minute. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, that's, that's a really long good. time, but that's, that's fair. It, yeah, you could probably do it in two seconds, but we'll put it at a minute. And what's what's the longest? So you have an 18-year-old who is developmentally delayed, nonverbal, and strong as a football player. Um, what's the longest it might take to swab a nose? I 
maybe add another minute to it. I mean, it really shouldn't take that long. Okay. I was so, thinking about even saying like up to five minutes because if you, um, in your fighting to get that swab, if you drop the kit on the floor and then you have to get a new kit. Yeah. And and again, we're we're, we're sort of ignoring all of the other steps that are that are I involved here just for for right now. Um, if it's if we're just thinking just the swab and the nose. Um, and so let's just say our decon nurses, it, maybe there's, uh, there's somebody else out there who's helping them, there's a tech, um, and all those other steps sort of go swimmingly. Um, so that swab is going to magically get sent and, uh, and we'll get our result. This, uh, this car's gonna peel out of there. And this is our system. This is our input. This is our output. This is the box that we're looking at. And we've constrained it and made it as simplistic as, as we can possibly make it. Um, with the Street Event Simulation Model, this is Arena software, but there are a lot of software environments like this. We can then kind of look at what happens. Cars come up, they get that nose swab, they leave. Um, it seems like this is going to work really well. Um, but what happens if we then say, oh, you know what, like the, the decon nurse is out there by themselves and they actually does take some time to gown up and gown down and there's only one swab available at a time. So they have to walk up to the lab and then walk back to get for each individual swab. We haven't figured out batching yet. Um, and so let's, there's, we forgot about all these steps and the decon nurse is now more stressed. And what we're gonna see is that these cars are going to pile up. This is on Michigan Avenue. So we got a problem. We can't have this queue. So we get, we can adjust that number again and we can maybe run an in-person simulation and say, well, we need somebody out there who's helping them. And maybe we can get the average time down to five minutes. Can everybody see on my, I know this is not mm -hmm. dialed up as far as, as Zoom, but just, just as sort of a loose example for what you can do, how you can experiment with this type of model. You can, tinker not only with the inputs and the outputs, but the amount of time each process might have to take. So you can set goals for yourself when you're developing a new system. Um, and in addition to having these cars come in, we're, we're suddenly doing really, really well. Um, but then all the out-of-state drivers from Southern Maryland decide that they also, you know what, they, they want to get the free testing and they've heard that um, we're not actually checking licenses, so they're going to come and they're they're all going to get their noses tested too, and they're coming every ten minutes. Um, what is that going to do now to our wait times? Which is a little bit faster with a mouse. All right, so we got all these people. They're coming in, they're lining up. Maybe this is on the other the other part of Michigan Avenue, and then suddenly we start to have to wait twice as long for um, you start to have to wait twice as long to get the swab. It just takes more time. Um, and you, each individual change to our system, we can get some idea of the wait time, the queue that people are sitting on Michigan Avenue and just how terrible this idea is. Um, or what extra resources. If we wanted to add a second nurse, that would be as easy as um, telling our model system that there are actually two nurses rather than one. Um, and I'm not going to build this system out anymore because it's fundamentally flawed. Um, Jen Fritzine, do you want to tell me some of the flaws that we've started to talk about with this particular model of our system? Well, just the fact that we hadn't uh, looked in, drill, really drilled down to all the resources needed. Yeah. Um, in order to really make this happen, how you know how long does it take the lab to run? Do we have somebody to run, you know run it up to the lab? Um, yeah, you know, how are we going to get them their results? Are they going to go park someplace while it's being run? Um, so yeah, there was a lot more to think about. There's a, we've actually overly constrained. We have overly constrained the system by trying to make an overly simplistic model. Um, and there are lots of resources we're not including. We're not thinking about the, what might actually be the largest effect. The thing that would be most interesting to study is the change in traffic patterns on Michigan Avenue. This doesn't make sense. We'd have ambulances waiting for 
cars to move by so they can get their nose swabbed for non-critical illness. Um, and our model has no way of answering what's the most interesting question about that system change. So when you're planning to build any model, it's really important to think about what are the outcomes you want to measure and are you gonna have the data to build a model that can answer those questions? Um, we don't, and so that, uh, that model's going nowhere. It's very sad, but thank you for spending some time on it with me. Um, there are a lot of different applications for discrete event simulation if you do have the right data and you're asking the right question. I'm not gonna run through all of these. There are specific healthcare applications some of which I've worked on and um, a lot of which have crossover with sort of tabletop simulations and other methods for simulation that I know Cindy's worked on. Um, in, in the last year, I started to get more and more interested in disaster planning um, well before COVID um, and, and my failed mini model, mini model with all of you. Um, regardless of the question you're trying to study, each process in a model, and, and you can imagine from the model that we just built together, there are many, many more processes. Um, I was going to show an example of the model I built in the fellowship, for example. Um, if, each, if you can imagine each box representing a different process or a different decision node in a map of a patient's journey through an emergency department, it gets much, much more complex if you want to answer an interesting question than what we tried to do for disaster, for, for our, our COVID modeling. And each one of these flows is specific to a different acuity of patients. Um, and this was actually too simplistic a model to answer many questions here at Children's National. So um, I have no further points on that. Um, was I trying to get at with uh, uh, hierarchy here? It, it, it's, it, it's essentially that um, each of those little boxes in a model, regardless of how complex you're making it, you need to be able to assign some mathematical relationship to that process in order for a, a, for a discrete event simulation model to function. And we assign that mathematical relationship using real world data when we have the ability. Um, so when you're planning a model, you need to know where you'll get your data for each process and you emphasize using the highest quality data wherever possible. Um, I imagine most of you have met Jim Chamberlain. He's built an amazing data infrastructure of retrospective emergency department data that's highly useful for, for determining patient acuity, arrival patterns, as well as general patient throughput. I also, last year, when I was starting to think about building a full model of our emergency department, I'd spoken with a few medical students who were interested in doing direct observations of specific processes, um, which is really time consuming, but a great way to get very granular data, um, especially data that might not be available in, in our retrospective database. Um, what? Oh, the, yeah, the problem before I, before ever modeling any disaster, I, I had no good idea for how we could get data to represent the processes involved in responding to a disaster outside of expert opinion. And there's not actually great uh, publications on this, that most of disaster medicine publications don't tend to report very granular findings, like the amount of time a nurse might um, be required to treat uh, a triage level red patient who's coming to a pediatric ER. That, that just doesn't really exist anywhere. So if I wanted to model those processes within a larger emergency department or within a larger hospital model, I'd be using notional values from expert opinions, which is just not that motivating. So um, early in uh, 2019, I'd heard that Joelle, Cindy, Jen, and I know the whole trauma team had, uh, had efforts for disaster drills before, and I got word that there was another disaster drill in the works for the for coming up in June of last year. Um, so we held that disaster drill and included back-to-back -back arrival of eight simulated patients to the ER. And on shift ED clinical team members responded. The hospital as a whole did not respond, 
um, which we might get to what that means at, at sort of the end of this presentation. Um, but the, the, this was an in situ drill where all of the ER responded. And there were observers that recorded the clinical role of everybody responding and the time they entered each, and, each, and the time that they entered and left each patient room. We also had video recording to verify real time observations. And we calculated the total duration of nurses and physicians uh, that they were directly involved with, with uh, patient care. So suddenly I had this very awesome granular data into which I could, uh, with which I could uh, build the processes of a mass casualty incident response in the model as a whole. And I, uh, I, I didn't really have a good sense of how quality this data is because it's from a simulated event. Um, Jen Smell, tell me, where do you think it, on this hierarchy of the quality of data are direct observations of a simulated event? Do you mean where, when they would occur or like, I'm it's a, it's a know what I'm thinking question. And I don't actually know what I'm thinking, but. Because the observations are to me how, as real as you're gonna get. It's what the, what's happening now. It is what is happening in our in situ environment, but it's not the real event. So it's, it's somewhere between the quality of data you would expect from prospective observations of the real event and okay. data from a, a comparable system. And so I, I don't really know uh, how to categorize this data. And I don't think that other, I, I haven't read any, um, any methodology where this has been used before, a sim, uh, that, that data observed from a simulation of simulated training exercise is incorporated into a simulation model, but it, it's relatively high quality data is the way I'm thinking of it um, and the way I'll describe it in, in an eventual manuscript. Um, so this is, uh, gets a little bit dizzying um, and it, it's, I, I'm going to not go through all of these boxes because it's just too much and, and we, we won't all make it together through the end of this hour. Um, but it's this, this is the conceptual model I used when I was learning how to do, use this methodology for fellowship. And I want to focus on the middle. There are four basic steps to model building. Um, which are represented in that circle in the middle. Model building is painstaking. It's an iterative process that involves multiple cycles of data preparation, model translation, which is basically programming, verification, and validation. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these just very quickly. Um, if you ever read a study that uses discrete event simulation modeling, it's important to be familiar with each step because if, if that particular step was not described, it was probably not performed adequately. And if it's not, if, for example, a model is not validated, then you can't use any of the insights of experimenting on that model to make conclusions about the real world. So each step, um, if you understand it in principle, um, it, it's important to, to confirm that if somebody's telling you they have a model, it's important to confirm they've done each of these things if you want to take them seriously. Um, input data preparation means using the best available data for each process. And we've already talked a fair amount about this. Um, you use the best available data from each process in the system to represent that process mathematically. And for discrete event simulation, we most often represent the duration of a process as a probability distribution function. Um, which I'm not going to get into today. Jen Fritzine, can you tell me a computer programming language? No. <laughs> I'm sure you know any computer programming language. Name one. No, no, all right, I'll, I'll give up on Jen Fritzine. Um, let's go to Liz. Liz. Name one computer programming language. I absolutely cannot <laughs> oh my god uh all Thank right you, Liz. cindy somebody help me visual basic visual basic is a computer programming language i know zero computer programming languages c plus plus is uh relatively powerful python is 
uh, maybe a, a language that you got, you will all hear more about. Um, is it open source language that a lot of people are using now for machine learning projects? Um, and there, are, like, Apple Basic is another example that is sort of like sort of out in the general atmosphere. Um, technically, the work that we just did of putting those boxes one in front of the other within the arena simulation environment is computer programming. We are inputting a logic into a system that our processor is interpreting in a specific way to generate a program and give us some important output. Um, but it only sort of kind of, kind of counts. Model translation is, is just the most basic form of computer programming. And what we just did, putting those boxes in relation to each other, is model translation. We're defining the logic of the system. And there are multiple software suites that make this relatively straightforward, like the Arena one I just showed. Um, although you can do it directly in Python and other programming languages. Um, I think that's enough to know about translation, but um, in any in any project where somebody's describing discrete event simulation modeling, they should at least reference what language they use or what software they use. Because if, if they don't, then they may be doing they may not actually be doing computational modeling, um, and it might be more guesswork and less uh, mathematical than what they're trying to present. It's important to verify that uh, and verify a model, and that's by simulating the flow of patients to ensure they move from process to process appropriately. It's at this point that you can correct errors by redefining malfunctioning processes. This is where I start to lose some people. We're almost done with the dense, uh, color-coded uh, nonsense circle, but um, it's impossible to interpret the output of a discrete event simulation model if it hasn't been validated in some meaningful way against the real system. So um, hold on to that. Any work that's been done saying I built a model and then I used it to test our system is just meaningless if, if um, the modeler is able to describe how that model's been validated. Um, so we've collected a lot of data to input into our model and built for, for the disaster model specifically and built most of the program to study our system. The observations listed above here, I, I think are interesting, but these are model inputs. They are not model outputs. And I've not yet verified that patients travel through the model as anticipated, nor have I validated model <laughs> outputs against real world data for this project. Cindy, if I told you that an MCI with a rapid arrival of eight patients with, uh, after a shoot, school shooting event, if I told you that my model predicts that other high acuity patients in the ER are suddenly gonna wait another hour. Do you believe that? Do you care about my results? Yes. What's both. that? Yes to both. Yes, I think that other people are gonna to have to wait longer and I would care about that. So it, it checks out with, it, it checks out with your notion um, and it fits our hypothesis and it's a meaningful outcome, but it's, it's not actually, uh, so first of all, I don't have those results, but you can't believe me if I haven't verified and validated my model yet, which for this project, I haven't, um, but we're, we're going to get there. Um, there are other things that I have been able to show using discrete event simulation modeling, and I'll go quickly through them before I open up this as a forum to, to pick your thoughts on my current project. Um, so at Columbia, which is where I did training, we were able to show that there is not a significant cost to patient throughput by, this is nothing to do with disaster modeling. This is a totally different project, but um, there's no significant cost to patient throughput by implementing a time specific protocol designed to rapidly deliver antibiotics to children with cancer and central lines who present to the ED with fever. And in our model, the population of cancer patients presenting to the ED would have to increase sevenfold before there was a significant slowdown for other patients. And then the a project specific to Children's National, um, 
and this is part of a different project where I did not model the whole emergency department, but we were able to validate the model for specifically for use for patients with behavioral health complaints. Uh, I worked with the ED psychiatry team to predict the system effects of implementing universal pediatric ED screening for suicide risk. And the psychiatry team had proposed two different approaches to implementing universal suicide risk screening, and we wanted to evaluate the potential impact of each one. So this figure is a little bit confusing, but is a, a good representation of what type of output you can expect from a simulation model. Um, and it's a simio measure of risk and error plot. It's a small plot of the number of days each year with overflow of patients with behavioral health complaints into medical care areas. And as part of this project, we were looking at if we start screening everyone for suicide risk, either in the emergency department or throughout the health system, we then need to appropriately respond to positive screens. And some of those patients are gonna wind up occupying behavioral health beds in the ER, which are already overflowing on a pretty regular basis. Um, so we wanted to look at by, by broadening screening and appropriately responding to positive screens, what does that do to overflow? Um, and it looks bad. So um, model outputs for our existing system, as well as models with universal PZD screening and universal system-wide screening are represented by each of these box and whisker plots. Um, and they demonstrate drastic differences in expected unit overflow between the models. And this most aggressive approach to universal suicide screening could lead to unit overflow with the majority of patients, uh, unit overflow for these patients, the majority of days each year. Um, as you can probably imagine, the team opted against that approach. So there is an operational utility to these projects as well as a planning and research utility to them. Um, Back to disaster, I, as I said, the, that model has uh, exploded in complexity because I wanna capture the patient flows through uh, of every acuity level um, and all the resources in the ER. It's just, I, I'm not there yet. I don't have results and I haven't been able to validate the model yet against our, our historical data. But what I'd like to use my last little bit of time for is getting insight from all of you on what should our outcome be? And um, the, the current approach that I've taken is um, an, an interesting outcome to look at is if you increase the number of patients that are presenting very back, in a back-to-back -back fashion from a mass casualty incident, um, as you increase that number of patients, how is that related to increases in wait time for other high acuity patients in the ER? And what, what are the necessary ER and hospital resources to mitigate the cost? So especially emergency severity index two patients, we expect that they need, we have an expectation that they'll be seen by an attending physician within 20 minutes. And it's going to be impossible for that to happen with some number of patients from an MCI. Um, what, when, as that number grows, what is the relationship between that number and the additional staffing to maintain a, as close to appropriate care as possible for those other high acuity patients? Anyway, it's a, it's a complex, meaningful outcome, um, but there may be better ones. And what do you guys think? I think it's really interesting, but super complicated. Oh, I lost you, Cindy. Yeah, I think uh, the, the audio isn't the greatest, but um, I think it's really interesting. And like, even now I have like such a better idea of what it can, what the potential um, outcomes could be for projects like this than I did before. Uh -huh. um, but it really is complicated when you try to put in every single part that um, affects like time spent in an ER. Yeah, part, part of it is, so I, if my only question is how, wh what are the impacts of a disaster? Um, I can keep the model pretty simple. Once I start to say, what are the changes we would need to make in order to mitigate 
the bad effects of that disaster. It becomes more complicated. And then I started to think of other questions I wanted to ask with this model so I don't have to build multiple models, um, which will save me time in the long run. But for example, um, what is the impact of implementing a sedation service in our emergency department and, um, and requesting access to one of the ortho rooms, the space for that? Is, is a separate question I want to ask with this model. Um, but the level of detail I need on physician and nurse resources throughout the whole ER to answer that question as well as a, a disaster question, it just, it explodes in complexity um, and it takes time. And that's the biggest cost for, I, I think, this methodology in general is to build a good model that you can then validate and then ask multiple interesting questions with. Um, it's a lot of resources. Yeah, like one thing that I could see that could be really interesting just from like a time perspective is if we had um, like say a whole bunch of burn patients came into the ER and um, depending on what type of dressing the like residents or ER physicians used, uh -huh. um, you know, how long were they in or you could even like look at like the size of the burn, how long were they in the ER, the type of dressing they were, um, were gonna be put in, how long were they in, um, what type of sedation was used, you know, all of those little things just for that burn population. Jen or Liz, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's actually interesting, Kenny. This actually aligns with a ton of the work that I've done with burn clinic and throughput and trying to import, improve um, pain and anxiety in the clinic. So on a separate note, I'd be happy to, to sit down and talk to you about some of those initiatives. So yeah. Yeah, totally on board with, with the ED oh, sedation. I love I think. the burn. Yeah, I love the, the burn dog. Like, well, I, I, I think be promising on this. Yeah, yeah. So definitely we'll need to collaborate about that. Um, For both you, Cindy and Liz, the, um, your sense of like what, what can be studied is, is spot on. That like, if you change the duration of a process, and so specifically mm -hmm. the how long it takes to debride a wound, then you can make that isolated change in this theoretical environment inside the model and mm -hmm. decide what, what is your outcome of interest? How, what's the length of stay for those patients? How's that impacted? What's the length of stay for other patients on D side? Um, might be a little bit more complicated, but we could get at. And so um, it's exactly that type of system change that is well suited for DES. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thought, um, and Jen Smell, this was, I was thinking about like different things that they could use um, or that you guys could use in the PICU of like how long does it take um, a group to take a patient down for a head CT versus how long does it take to prep the room for an inpatient, like when they bring the CT to the bedside for a head? Like which one actually takes longer? Do you do you think that would be interesting or? No, I think it would help because I think, you know, I have limited experience with any of this. My, as I'm listening to all of this, it's fascinating to me. Um, and the closest thing that I can, you know, sort of remember from being at a different um, organization's PEDS emergency department when we were working on our own throughput initiatives is that lean methodology, the you know, the trigger is, you know, the patient arrives and, and you know, until discharge and all of the um, tasks and the times that happen in between all of those things from start to finish and, you know, sorting out, you know, some of the easier um, patients. But I, I agree with you, Cindy, it's, it's complex. And, but yeah, a simple thing like uh, bedside CT versus traveling with a patient which seems much more complicated, but I think you'd have to understand and maybe make an observation or look at the average, whether you could pull that data from Cerner to see how long each one of them takes. We assume it's, you know, the, the traveling part, but I don't know. And uh, traveling is, all, I mean, that, that some of this, what, what's, Challenging with building these models is again, sometimes you have to go back to where you're going to get that data and some of it might be available in Cerner, but if you suspect that a major contributor to delays uh, in and around head CTs for PICU patients 
is the travel time. Um, you know you're gonna you're gonna wind up needing some prospective observations for that because the chances that you can get that quality data from the EHR are it just seems very unlikely. Then it, the flip side is that those are probably pretty easy prospective observations to do. Sure. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of different things this could be used for. Well, I think, I'm not going to go through this, but um, I have many <laughs> thanks. And um, you guys don't actually need this because you're all Children's National folks. Um, write to me with emails on questions of questions about what this is or, or how, how this type of model works or research ideas. Operational ideas I'm not technically allowed to work on with the software license that I have. Um, although I'm certainly interested in those and would try and see them from a research perspective that might um, that might allow us to get some operational insights as well. Um, but thank you so much for your questions and your forced participation. Um, I'm going to think more about burn patients if 